Hi, this is Dr. Olavsky, and welcome to the Rabbi Olavsky Show. And wherever you're watching, wherever you're listening, wherever you are sensing, maybe you can just sense that this is taking place. Certain people are attuned to the higher realms. And we actually have a sponsor this week, the Chavetz Chaim Heritage Foundation, uh, which has, of course, galvanized the world towards the sensitivity of the laws of Shemir Salashim. And one of the most difficult areas is, of course, talking about what you're allowed to say and what you can't say. You want to hear a horrible story? Sure you do. That's why you listen to this podcast. I got this letter from someone who says there's a Rosh Hashiva. He is a Shita no matter what. He never says anything bad about a boy. He says, so this person knows the story. He was there. So they had a Hanhala meeting about whether or not to throw this boy out. And um, right after the meeting, somebody calls about this boy. He goes, we were just talking about this boy. I can't believe it. I had the whole Hanol in here. We were just discussing, oh, what a boy. I'm telling you, the whole yeshiva is talking about him. <laughs> what can you say? What you can't say? So the Chavetz Chaim Heritage Foundation has a program called Clarity Calls to teach you a 40-day program of what to say and what not to say to help you get the clarity and the confidence to handle every shidduch call right. You have to know what you can say, what you can't, when you are supposed to ask a rav. So we're going to show you a video. It's a video in a video. This is like so meta. So watch this video. Uh, I watched it. I had such. I really enjoyed it. As nene, yeah. Okay, this is a video about clarity calls. Chavetz Chaim Heritage Foundation. Hello. Hello. I'm calling for shidduch information about Sarah Cohen. Can you tell me a bit about her, please? Yes. Sure. Sarah is such an amazing girl. She's also an amazing daughter, an amazing sister, an amazing friend, an amazing student, an amazing driver. Would it be okay if I ask a couple of specific questions about her? Okay, let's see. The Torah says, Lo That means, no Lashon Hara. So, I'm not going to say anything bad. Oh, but it also says, Lo Sa'amod Al Damriyecha. So I've got to stop a bad shidduch from happening. So what do I say? Is she loud or quiet? Both. Is she a follower or a leader? Oh, definitely both. Is she more likely to be a teacher or work in fashion? Both. I could see her teaching fashion or perhaps dressing teachers. Uh-huh. Okay, thank you. You've been so helpful. The line will be disconnected. It can be hard to know just what to say when it comes to Shadokim. Join Clarity Calls, a 40-day learning program of the Halachos of Shmiras Halashon, and get the clarity and halacha that you need as it applies to Shadokim and giving Shidduch information. Okay, so uh, I hope you consider this. If you want to find out more about this program, go to the website CCHF. That's Chavetz Chaim Heritage Foundation, but it's the Reshi Tevels, yeah dot global backslash clarity calls backslash and uh what can i tell you it ties in so nicely with everything we have been doing so i'd like you to seriously consider this as you can imagine a series that has gone on this long talking about shiduchim and you know dating and marriages and all that kind of nifty stuff obviously is going to draw a lot of reaction and i have to say that the overwhelming amount of reaction that I have gotten from people has been positive. Um, I keep getting letters reinforcing many ideas that I have said. Some people question uh, some of the things that I've said, and I have blocked their emails. But uh, occasionally, I get uh, a letter. I have to say it's tiny percentage uh, by comparison who say, I'm not interested in this topic. Talk about something else. Hey, got news for you. Anytime you want to hire me for a private uh, share, I am available. <laughs> this is my podcast, and I'll talk about whatever I want. 
<laughs> but there was one uh, uh, answer, uh, 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 email, that I did find intriguing. And that was, he says, Rabbi Lasky, talk about whatever you want. But, you know, not all of us are in the top of the Shidduchim. Yeah. Uh, so maybe you could start off with a little Dvar Torah. I thought about it. And it reminded me years ago before Corona, when people used to fly and travel and speak places, that I would occasionally go to schools years ago when there were schools. And, um, and uh, I would uh, go into the office and I would see a sign above the school secretary's desk. And the funny thing is, I saw this sign in a lot of school secretaries' offices. It could be wherever the school secretary buys supplies, they offer this sign for sale. It could be that there is a school secretary uh, group that meets uh, in secret and share ideas along with this particular sign. I don't know. But it always made an impression on me. It said, I can only make one person happy today. Today is not your day. Tomorrow doesn't look good either. That always made such an impression on me because I know what it's like to go into a school secretary's uh, office. Okay, full disclosure, I'm 62 years old. But I have managed to maintain a certain youthful exuberance by never growing up. And I remain the kid to this day. So when I was running NCSY and I was already an adult and I'd be talking to some teenager and they'd say, hmm, I'm not sure, may I put my mom on? Mom! And I'd be like, no, no, don't get your mom. Don't get your mom. <laughs> I'd go to speak in the school and they say, uh, yeah, please wait in the school principal's office. And I was like, I didn't do anything. <laughs> you think that I would have moved beyond that, but, you know, I really have not. So, um, you know, as you go into a school secretary's office, there is still that sense that, you know, school secretary, you know, it's like, you know. Um, why are you late again? <laughs> anyway, uh, so I thought of that. When I, uh, I can only make one person happy a day, but hey, this is your day. So I decided I would start off with a Dvar Torah, one of my favorite. It's one of my favorite Dvar Torah for a lot of reasons. One is it works on a lot of parashios, as we're going to see. It goes... You can use this on a lot of different parashios. You can pull out this idea. Plus, I think that it reveals an eternal truth. Uh, after I finish the Devat Torah, then I will show you how it ties back into what I wanted to talk about this week anyway. And the third thing is, it is one of a number of shiurim that I developed during the year where I decided to learn the Das Kingdom. Uh, every year I learn Rashi. And I decided I would add another Rishon. And uh, I picked the Dust Canaan. Why? For the obvious reason that it's short, right? I had a guy come to my house once when I was younger and I had patience and tolerance. I don't anymore, but, um, and I, uh, I said, um, uh, can you, uh, you, you, you want to say the Torah? So he knew already from his friends, he's supposed to say the Torah and you come to my house. So he pulls out a piece of paper and he starts to read this piece. And I'm telling you, it was incoherent. The words coming out of his mouth had nothing to do with reality, with anything. I, I could not string the words together. I said, what? And he said, read it again. I said, where did this come from? He says, the Emes Yaakov. So I take the Emes Yaakov and I open it up. And I come to the piece. The whole thing is Rashi Tevos and Meyer Makomas. It took me 15 minutes just to figure out what he was talking about. And I looked at him and said, why would you pick this? And without hesitating, he said, because it was the shortest one there. So that's, as I look back, I ask myself, why didn't I choose the Rashbam on Chumash? Yeah, well, maybe the Sporno. But uh, I remember the Das Kanem. Yeah. And a lot of Das Kanem, uh, you read it and you're like, what? What did he say? <laughs> and uh, I worked on, a number of them, and I've developed different shiram over the years, and this is one of them. Yeah? So, this is what I would like to share uh, at the beginning of the year, and then you'll see, I think, why I want to share this particular idea. 
So the Ramban asks, what the Mishkan doing in Parsha Shmos? Why is this here? Well, it's basically about a Voda, it should be in Vayikra, Taurus Kahanim. So he says that the Mishkan is essentially a traveling uh, Harsinai. He meets on Tetzay Torah, and the Torah will continue to come from Bein HaKruvim. And so the Mishkan is like a Harsinai that we keep with us all the time, right? Okay. So we begin in Parsha's Truma by listing the materials you're going to need for the construction. And it says, this is what you bring. Yeah, Zav Kesev and Achoshes, gold, silver, and copper. Where did that come from? Well, when they left uh, Egypt, they took anything that was of value. These were uh, metals that were considered precious metals that they made coins out of. That's why they had that. Tchelas Argamon Tola Ashani Sheish Ve'izim. Tchelas and Argamon is and Tola Ashani a dyed wool that was so incredibly expensive they were reserved for royalty um uh, the argaman was weighed like gold so these were extremely valuable cloths sheish as we know rashi tells us linen in egypt was particularly precious the izim uh, izim they they took uh, animals with them obviously they took flocks Oros Elam Me'adamim, dyed rams uh, skins. Okay, they had rams, they were animals. Oros Tchashim, Mara says, what's a Tachash? It's a one-horned creature that stays hidden, has rainbow colors, and came out in hiding uh, just for them to make the Mishkan. So they didn't take it for them. Yeah, I have to wait till he shows up. The Atzei Shitim, and Atzei Shitim. Wood. Where they get wood from? Pashtas, they didn't bring it with them. Why would you bring wood with you? There used to be a TV show called uh, Supermarket Sweepstakes, where you have a cart and you have to run through the supermarket. I don't know how many minutes you have to fill it up. Obviously, you don't fill it up with paper towels. You go for the most valuable things uh, when you go shopping. You know, that's, that's what you're obviously going to fill it up with. So if you're coming out of Mitzrayim, why would you bring um, uh, wood? Bring wood with you out into the desert? Oh, maybe it was growing out there in the desert. Well, one of the things about a desert is they are notorious for the fact that they have no trees. Otherwise, they wouldn't be called a desert. They would be called a forest. So one of the ways of telling a difference between a forest and the desert is whether or not there are trees. Yeah. So where did it come from? So Rashi tells us. Yeah. Where did they come from? Ma'ayin ha'yil lehem ba'midbar. Peresh Rabbi Tanchuma. Yaakov avinu tzofa baruach ha'kodesh. Yaakov avinu soar. So I see them in Yisrael live nice mishkan ba'midbar. They're going to have to build this mishkan. The heavy arosim le Mitzrayim in the Tom, and he planted these trees in Mitzrayim. The tziva lebanav, and he commanded his children, litlam imahem kishiyatz Mitzrayim, to take them out. Now they didn't know why. Erev Pesach, things were pretty busy, collecting gold, silver, expensive clothing. Um, uh, gosh. Uh, 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 looking for Yosef, uh, you know, and uh, cutting down trees. Cutting down trees to take along with them. Why? Uh, Yaakov told us to. That's where they came from. Fine. All right? That's in Parshish Truma. Now, the Das Kanim on this Pasuk brings two Pshatu. He doesn't just say that. Lakas Kanim brings two answers. He says, where did they come from? This is the second shot. He brings like Rashi. The first shot is, he says, they came from a place called Shittim. This is where the Jews were living at the end of 40 years, where everything took place, where 
the Benos Moab, the Benos Midian, caused the Jewish people to sin. And Magefa almost wiped everybody out. And Zimri took a, you know, a Midianite and, uh, and uh, Pinchas uh, had to kill him. And, you know, you know, the whole story. So there's a place called Shittim. And he says the reason it was called Shittim is because uh, Shittim trees grew there. And that's what it was called Shittim. Okay. Now, you understand that if no Shittim trees grew there, there'd be no reason to call them Shittim, right? That's clear. So he brings a second shot, like Rashi, that Yaakov planted them in Egypt and told them to take them out. I guess, he, according to the second shot, there were no Shittim trees growing there, right? Okay. Now, go to uh, the end of Parsha's Bullock, where my uh, Shittim takes place. And the Pesach says, V'yeshru Yisrael b'shitim. And the Das Kenim brings a machlekes. Yeah? One says, it says they were living in Shittim. Shittim was the name of the place. And the second shot says, no, it wasn't called Shittim. It was called something else. Pittsburgh. Yeah? Why did we call it Shittim? Because... Um, Osu uh, Maisa Stus. They did something crazy. 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 Crazy town. You ever hear that expression? It's like crazy town. This was crazy town. That's why it was called Shitim. That wasn't the real name of the place. <coughs> okay. So we can line up these two shots. If you say the place was called Shittim, it's because Shittim and trees grew there. And that fits in with the first shot in Truma, where he says they got the trees from Shittim. But if the trees didn't come from Shittim, they came from Egypt. And in fact, there were no trees growing there. Then there'd be no reason to name the place Shittim. And therefore, they must come from someplace else. Right? Um, there is a place in Queens called Elmhurst. My guess is there must be a lot of elm trees that grew there. There is a place in Detroit, yeah, called Oakhurst. My guess is there must have been a lot of oak trees that grew there. What particular flat bush that neighborhood in uh, Brooklyn was named after, I don't know. It'd be interesting to find that original flat bush that they named it after, but this is where the names would come from, right? If there were a lot of trees growing there. So Shittim would only be called Shittim if there were Shittim trees there. If there are no Shittim trees there, it would be a little silly. You know? I came from North Merrick, Long Island. Yeah, Merrick was named after the Moroccan Indians much as the Rockaways were named after the Rockaway Indians. Yeah. But um, if you know Long Island at all, you know, the chief of the Moroccan Indians, his name was Wanto. So there's a little community out there called Wanto. That's where that comes from. But, you know, I was uh, a kid in camp. Someone says to me, where do you come from? I say, North Merrick. He says, Merrick, what kind of name is that? I said, it's an Indian name. He says, no, it's not. I said, yes, it is. He goes, there are no Indian words that end with CK. Like he knows. In Indy speaks Indian, you know. So there was a little kid on the on, on the bus and he goes, What about Tomahawk? <laughs> so those two line up very nicely. Now here's the problem. There is a one line das kanem in Parsha's Vyakel. Now, I would like just a moment. Obviously, everybody who listens to this podcast knows this already. But eh, for those of you who might be listening, you might have the first time or new listeners, I am exceptionally gifted. I mean, this is clear to those of you who have been following for some time. But uh, those of you who may not know it, I sometimes meet people and I say, uh, they say, who are you? I said, I'm Rabbi Olavsky. I'm, I'm very famous. They go, really? I said, yeah, a lot of people don't know that, so I have to tell them. But trust me, I'm really very famous. <laughs> 
<laughs> so in case you haven't picked it up yet, I, I'm very gifted. I used to teach Parsha in Or Sameach. It was such an unusual shit because I had beginners. It was in the beginners program. I had beginners in Or Sameach and guys from Mira and Brisk who used to come also. So I used to translate all the terms, but they were my own chidushim, you know. I remember one time I was being beaten up on the internet. It happens from time to time. You know? It's hard to believe that there are some people out there who don't like me. Anyway, I was being beaten up and someone said, I went to his bar shashir, you know. He didn't say anything that you couldn't read in the art school. And I was like, I don't know which version of art school you have, but none of this stuff was ever there when I did it. So I had to give five shiurim a week for an hour. Yeah, an hour Shear on the parsha five times a week. Okay, so if you're doing uh, Lech Lecha, you're doing Noach, you know what I mean? It's pretty easy. Shmos. But you know where you separate the men from the boys? When you get to Vyako Pakude, especially when they're separate. There were other people who taught parsha. When they got to Vyako Pakude, they switched to Megillah. Put Megillah and then switched to Haggadah. Yeah, not me. I had easily five shiurim on Viyakio and easily five on Pekude. This was one of my Viyakio shiurim because it's a one-line Das Kenim in Viyakio. It says, you'll make the Aron. <coughs> Try again. <coughs> it says, you'll make the Aron out of Atsei Shitim. Why? Because the I'd say Shitim is Mechaper for the Maisa Shitim. Mechaper for the Maisa Shitim? How is it Mechaper for the Maisa Shitim? So let's line it up. If you say that the trees came from Shitim, then I understand. That's sort of the idea of Abraham Avinu when he comes to Israel. Every place where he knows B'nai Yisrael is going to have problems in the future, the city of Ai, Shechem, places like this, he builds a Mizbeach, he davens, he does something to convey the place. Because there's a big difference when you do something bad in a bad place. As it says about Shechem, it was a makom muhan laponiyais. It was, it was a bad place. Bad things happened there. As opposed to uh, you did something bad in a good place. Right? There's mitigating circumstances. Yeah, those of us who were not one of the good kids in school know this. Because if a kid who was not such a good kid and a kid who is a really good kid both do something wrong and they get called in for the principal, so the kid who's not such a good kid, they call the parents and say, pick up your son and take him home. And the other one, they go, I'm really surprised. A boy like you, a little disappointed. I'll go back to class and I want you to apologize to the Rebbe and, and think about what you did. You're like, boo, boy, man, quiet, go home. <laughs> I have a friend, my Schmelly, tells me this great story. He was my roommate in, in Los Angeles. And uh, he says that he was always getting into trouble, you know, and everyone knew he, he was getting into trouble. So. Um, so one time he got one of those uh, laugh bags. You, know, you hear those laugh bags go, ah, 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 you know. He says, I was always getting into trouble. And the principal would walk into the room and he would just go, Schmel, go home. <laughs> he says, so one time he hid inside of the ceiling you know moved one of the panels and put it up there and when it went off they were in the middle of class it went off it was booming through the building and you just hear this enormous voice going oh, ha, 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 yeah. and the Rebbe doesn't know what to do you know the principal walks in he looks around the room looks up the ceiling and he goes schmell go home <laughs> he says, what did I do because I just assume you had something to do with this <laughs> So if it's a good place, we already took the Atse Shitim from there. We built the Shitim. You know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a better thing. Okay. But if you're not such a good person, you know, 
It's a bad place. So, okay, so we took the Atse Shitim to build the Aron from Shitim, and that way it's Machaper. But if the Atse Shitim were planted in Mitzrayim by Yaakov Avin beforehand, what in the world does that have to do with the Maisa Shitim that the Jews do in Shitim? That's our question. And that brings us to Be'er Sheva. Be'er Sheva, you ask, what does Be'er Sheva have to do with this? Ah, I'm so glad you asked me that question. Yeah? I don't know how many of you have ever been to Be'er Sheva. My wife has a, I should say my mother-in-law has a first cousin who um, lives in uh, Be'er Sheva. He is a botanist, professor of botany, married to a professor of botany. Um, as you can imagine, uh, you know, their family grew there. <laughs> anyway, but uh, it really was a very exciting place to visit. Yeah, Be'er Sheva. So uh, I, I want to focus a little bit on my share. The Akedah Yitzchak, one of the most dramatic moments in human history, ends the following. Perik Chav Beis, Pasig Yud Tes. V'yoshev Avram el Na'orev v'yakumu v'yelchu yachtav. V'el Be'er Shava, they go to Be'er Shava. V'yeshev Avram be'er Shava. And he's living in Be'er Shava. Yeah? He goes from the Akedah, which is in Yerushalayim, to Be'er Sheva. Why did he go to Be'er Sheva? Well, the short answer would be because he was living in Be'er Sheva. He, just another way of saying he went home. The problem is, the next parsha starts. Chaf Gimel, Pasik Beis. But Thomas Sora Bekirias Araba Hi Chevron Be'eretz Canaan. Sora is in Hebron. V'yavol Abraham l'spod l'sora v'liv k'isa. And he comes to Hebron to bury his wife and to mourn her. Says Rashi. V'yavol Abraham me Be'er Sheva. He wasn't living in Be'er Sheva. He was living in Hebron. Now, there is a rabbi who likes to say controversial things. He takes pride in it. He's written any number of articles in which he says controversial things. Uh, many of them, uh, that's it, I don't want to say anymore. I do, but I don't know, I'm getting, uh, getting reticent to my old age. You know? So, uh, <coughs> I don't think I have to say more, but okay. Maybe I do. All right, forget. Anyway, so um, uh, he says that Sora was so upset at Avraham for taking Yitzchak out to the Akedah to kill him that she left him and moved to Hebron to like live on her own. So uh, forgetting about the. Uh, difficult implications of that story, there's a Rashi that says not like that. Um, just before the Akedah, Perek Chaf Aleph Pasek Lamed Dalit, Vayoga Abraham Be'eretz Plishtim Yomim Rabim, says Rashi, Merubim Al Shal Chevron. He lived there more than in Chevron. The Chevron, he lived 25 years. And in Eretz Plishtim, i.e. Be'er Sheva, 26 years. And uh, he makes a whole connection. The Oso Shana Kodma Lifnea Kedosa Shayitzchak Yudbe Shanim. And 12 years before the Akeda, he moved back to Hebron. So it's clear that they were living in Hebron. Now, I don't know how good your map sense is of direction without ways. 
They did not have ways thousands of years ago. Apparently the traffic wasn't so bad. Here's Yerushalayim. Here's Hebron to the south. Here's Be'er Sheva all the way to the south. That means after the Akeda, Abraham passed by his house, didn't stop in, and kept going straight down to Be'er Sheva. And then he hears Sarah died, and he goes back home. Why did he go to Be'er Sheva? Okay. Second example. You know this story. It is the only story where Yitzchak has a starring role. He's, there's a Rav, and so he goes to Eretz Plishtim, and he digs a well, they take the well. He digs his well, they take his well. Yeah? He digs a third well, <clears throat> and they don't take his well. Uh, they didn't fight with him. Now Hashem will make us big in the land and multiply us. And he left there and went to Be'er Sheva. You finally got a well. All's well that ends well. What are you going down to Be'er Sheva for? What was wrong? You finally, you dug a well. Now you go down to Be'er Sheva? Question number two. Question number three. Yaakov hears that Yosef is still alive. Serach Basha Usher uh, played the harp and sang to her grandfather. Od Yosef Chai, Od Yosef Chai, Od Yosef, Od Yosef, Od Yosef Chai. That's how the kids used to come home from God and they used to sing it. So I asked one of the gonna note how do you know that was the tune my Torah doesn't come with the tune he says some girls playing the harp and singing Bistama she's a Kalbach <laughs> as good an answer as any I ever heard anyway <coughs> so he hears that uh, he's still alive and he says Uh, Perik Mem Hey Pasik Chav Hey, Vayomi Yisrael Rab Od Yosef Bnei Chai El Chav Enel Beter Mamus. I will go and see him before I die. Perik Mem Vav, Vayisa Yisrael Vakol Hashelo Vayabo Beira Shava Yisvach Zvach Molkei Aviv Yitzchak. He's going down to Egypt and he stops in Beira Shava. Okay. What's the fastest way to get to Eretzrael from Egypt or from Egypt to Eretzrael? It's a Pasuk. It says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu did not take them Eretz Plishtim Ki Karavu. That was the natural road. You go from Egypt to Eretzrael up the coastal road. That's the fastest way to go. He didn't want to bring them because he was afraid they would see Muhammad and they'll get scared and then they won't go. Yeah, fine. So what does he do instead? Well, I should say, what Yaakov should have done is, he was in Shechem, cut straight across to the sea, and followed the coastal road. That's the best way to go down to Egypt. Instead, he goes down south to Beersheba. That's not effective. That's out of the way. Yeah? Why did he do that? Three times we find the Avos, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, for unclear reasons going to Be'er Sheva. So the Emes Yaakov in a number of different places, he says this. Um, Yaakov Kavanesky says an unbelievable thing. 
we all know that Avram Vinu planted an Asian, says Vita Asian. He says, what did he plant? And this is what this is what Rabbi Yaakov says. He says, when he heard of the Brisbane of Sarim, means 400 years they're going to be down in Mitzrayim. He said they're going to come out. Hashem said they're going to come out. And he figured out they're going to need a Mishkan. Well, that made sense. It says that when Yitzchak, we already mentioned this, when Yitzchak came into took Rivka into her mother's tent, all the nisim of the Mishkan took place, the cloud came over it, bread stayed warm, the candle stayed burnt. So it makes sense. He understood Klaish was going to need a Mishkan. So he planted the trees in Beersheba. And says Rabbi Yaakov, this became a place of solace and meditation where the others would go when they needed strength. As Kush Baruch Hu says to Moshe Rabbeinu, the beginning of Pasha's Ve'era, oh yeah, I miss the others. They never questioned me. They did whatever needed to be done. Yeah? So, uh, um, so I, I never, I never uh, demanded anything. They didn't see anything. They did. They did what they did on faith. Where did they get the strength? Says of Yaakov from these trees. Because they looked at these trees and they said, I'm going through some tough times. But you watch, my grandchildren's grandchildren are going to build a Mishkan out of these trees. And so after the Akedah, which was a wrenching emotional experience, he doesn't go home. He goes to his trees in Beersheba. That's where you go. Says Ramban, the experience that Yitzchak had is the Maisa of a similar bottom for Golis Bavel. And after he finishes that whole Nisayan, that whole Golis, he goes down to his trees, down to Beersheba. Yaakov Avinu is going down into Golis and he knows he's going to die in Golis. First, he goes to his trees. Because these trees represented the Geula. These represented the future. And when he was there, he said to himself, my father, my grandfather, needed the strength from looking at these trees to keep going. My children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren down in Mitzrayim, how will I have the strength to stand up to all the sufferings? So he uprooted these trees and took them down to Mitzrayim. When Rashi says he planted the trees in Egypt, it means he replanted the trees that Amravinu had already planted for the Mishkan. And says Rabbi Yaakov, this is how the Jewish people through all the suffering had the strength to keep going. They would go to these trees and they'd say, one day we're getting out of here. And we're going to build a Mishkan from these trees. If the place wasn't called Shittim, because the trees didn't come from there, they came from Egypt. How were they Mechapra for the Maisa Shittim, for Maisa Shtus? Because there's only one way to stop from being crazy. And that's to look at the big picture. If you understand that I got something from my grandfather's grandfather, then that tells me I have to pass something down to my grandchildren's grandchildren. I don't know if you could imagine this. Try. So now could you do it? Are you so-and-so? Yes, I am. I have a letter for you. And he pulls out this very old letter. And you look at it, and it's dated 1620. You say, what is this? And it says, I don't know, most amazing thing. 
This has been sitting in a post office in Poland. And eventually it was passed down and passed down. And <clears throat> they said at some point, well, the instructions were to deliver it 400 years later. So we looked around to find this person's descendant and it's you. Here's your letter, sign here. You open it up and it says, to my great, 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 great grandchild, I'm struggling here in Poland. Life is hard, economic hardship, anti-Semitism. Yeah, all the difficulties that we're going through. But remember, I'm doing all of this for you. Think that might make an impression. I used to give a class on intermarriage. And I'd say, uh, you know, the majority of people get intermarried have very little Jewish education. The more Jewish education, the less likely you are to intermarry. I said, so imagine this scene. Grandparents uh, pass away. And, uh, and you, um, you know, you want to sell the house. So you have to clean out the attic. Now, there's two ways to do this. There are services you can call. I know when my mother passed away, the house was filled with things. You call us come on a service. They come with a big dumpster, throw everything out, clean the whole place up. Ka-ching. The other way to do it is to go through all the boxes. You know, old people collect a lot of boxes. And you hear stories every day. They find old stocks and bonds, old baseball cards, collectibles, old jewelry hidden away someplace. Every day, people are finding a fortune. And every day, people are throwing away a fortune. The question is whether they take the time to open up the box. And I say, if you're a Jew today, you probably had two Jewish parents, four Jewish grandparents, eight great grandparents, 1632, 64, 128. You're not going back that far in time until there are hundreds of ancestors. 256, 512, 1024. Another few generations, you're dealing with thousands of people who had to make a decision to stay Jewish or you wouldn't be here today as a Jew. And they all were willing to go through this tremendous hardship for one reason, to pass this box down to you with something called the Tyra. Now, maybe they were all stupid. Maybe they know something you don't know. But I would suggest before you throw it in the garbage, open it up and look inside. When you know for a fact, you get a letter from 400 years ago. Everything I did in life, and my son, and my grandson, and my great grandson, and my great 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 grandson, and my great, 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 was just for you. That's the cure for my sisters. Because in order to do a my sisters, in order to be crazy, you have to not think. How many times would I speak to a teenager? And she would say something like, you know, well, I can do what I want. As long as a question, you get married, you have a teenage daughter and she wants to do this. What would you do? Invariably, the answer is I'd kill her. I said, could you explain that to me? It's different. Why is it different? Why? Because one is me right now making a decision. And the other one is looking ahead. The cure for my sashitim, the cure for my sashtus is that Avravinu planted these trees, Yaakov you know, replanted these trees, and we look at these trees and say, my grandfather's grandfather planted these trees. That's what I'm going to build the Mishkan from. Okay. There's your Dvar Torah. Right? It's a brief introduction. About 40 minutes. That's fine. Have you noticed that these podcasts are becoming longer? I don't know. I thought I'd be running out of things to say, but I so much more. You know, it reminds me of a story. I know. Anyway, so uh, where were we up to? We just had the chuppah. We just had the chuppah. So I want to use the chuppah to talk about a very sensitive topic. I hope you don't mind. 
<clears throat> and that is the fact that in Judaism, married women have always covered their hair. They learn it out from a Pusik by Saita. Saita is obviously a married woman. You can't be accused of adultery unless you're a married woman. And it says they uncover her hair. Say the Gemara, you see from this that a married woman has her hair covered. Right? So uh, the question is, when do you have to cover your hair? So some people hold that she becomes chayiv to cover her hair once she becomes a nesua. Last time we talked about the difference between an arusa and a nesua. And uh, therefore, at the chuppah. So some women wear a shaitel. Now, for those of you not familiar with the term, it's called a wig. Yeah. And they wear a shaitel going down the chuppah. Going down the chuppah. Why? Because as soon as they get married, they're in the sewer, they have to cover their hair. Some people say no. Standing under a chuppah with hundreds of people watching, that's not enough for you to cover your hair. Not until you are alone with a man. Because again, we're going to Sota. Sota is a woman who's been locked up with a man. You know what I mean? That's the suspicion. So after the chuppah, everybody dances over. And this is such a poignant moment especially those who have the minute that a husband and a wife do not see each other the week before. And this is their personal Yom Kippur and they've been fasting and he's wearing a kittel dressed in white. All their sins are forgiven. And for the first time you are alone with your kala and it is clear you are starving. They put food there and you were like, oh, I saw this, the smorgasbord. Oh, I didn't even have a smorgasbord. We just had like, you know, some old cake of lures and they just both eat. It's so Beautiful and poignant. And some people at that point, the woman puts on her shaito and comes out. Right? That's the second thing. And the third is not until they actually have relations. Right? Okay. But, uh, but this has always been Jewish tradition. There was a period of time when people did not. And I asked, I'm doing that from women who weren't covering their hair. I said, well, there must be a basis for it. And they show me an Aruch HaSholchan in Hilchas Kriyashma where he says, halachically, you are not allowed to say Kriyashma in front of a woman who's not dressed, including her hair not being covered. But today, because uh, things have fallen apart so terribly, yeah, you can say Kriyashma in front of a woman's hair. And that's why they say a woman doesn't have to cover her hair. I said, me, I'm not such a big tamachach that I'm making the yukim in Hilchas Kriyishma. I said, let's take the Yorcha Shochan and open up to Evan Ezra. Oh, look at this. He says it's an obligation from the Torah for a woman to cover her hair. Maybe some diak in Kriyishma for it. Okay. Now, one of the things I have done for a living is answer basic questions on Judaism. And I will, full disclosure, one of the hardest questions that I've had to answer is why women cover their hair. Mamanoshach. If hair is an erva, then a single girl should have to cover it also. And if hair is not an erva, then uh, why does a married woman have to... How does it turn into an heir when she gets married? Okay, here's the standard answer. The standard answer is <coughs> the standard answer is well, you know, now that you're married, it's not really an heir, but it's something that's special just between you and your husband, you know. And uh, it's something which is not erva dick in its nature, but once you get married, yeah, like the Gemara says, you're not allowed to look at a single girl if she's beautiful. You're not allowed to look at a married woman even if she's ugly. Because once she's married, it's none of your business anymore. You shouldn't be checking her out on any level. If, you, if she's single, you might be thinking, I want to marry her, etc. You know, I said, okay. Yeah. Otherwise, there's no reason for it. Yeah. So um, the problem I have is then people ask me, what about Shaylach? Because there are women who wear sheitlach that's nicer than their original hair. Now, here's a couple of problematic answers. You're right, you shouldn't wear sheitlach. But yes, you shouldn't wear sheitlach. I said, what about all the from women who do wear sheitlach? 
Okay, well, you can wear a shaito, but you can't wear like a, you know, a hair shaito that looks so real that you can't even tell, only uh, if it's one that you can still tell what my mother used to call a horse's tail, you know what I mean? Okay, otherwise not. And then they, I, I tried this answer, you know, and people start listing off rebitsons. Choshva rebitsons. Married to Choshva Rosh Hashiva and Rabbanim who wear very realistic looking shaitlach. Checkmate. <laughs> I have an answer. I have a good answer. And once I was teaching a class of Rabbanim, and a guy said to me, I heard an answer once. This is the best answer I've ever heard. A woman is not covering her hair because of men. Otherwise, if it was really an Arab, a single girl would have to wear it also. Hair is not an Arab. Yeah. The reason that she covers it once she gets married is because before a woman gets married, she has a part of her that is private that nobody knows about. And there's no way of knowing. And once she gets married, she loses that privacy. And she covers her hair for herself so that there will always be a part of her that's private just for her. And just like the other private part she chooses to share with her husband, this she can also choose to share with her husband. But that's it. It's for herself that she's able to maintain some level of privacy. I thought that was brilliant. It doesn't matter if it looks like a real hair. It's not the hair that's a problem. Otherwise, a single girl would have to cover it too. It's the fact that her status has changed. And therefore, don't paskin from me. I'm not that kind of a rabbi. Yeah? I have a yara yara. I learned kashras. You, know, you have any questions on sheitlach? Drop it into a pot of chicken soup. I'll tell you what to do. That's, that's my area. That's all I can deal with. So... Um, <clears throat> I just had such a fascinating experience over Shabbos. A couple of my kids just started asking me questions. What's the best this? What's the best that? What's the best this? What's the best that? And most of them I could answer, you know? In fact, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe I'll bring on one of my kids into my podcast and we'll do this just as a fun thing, you know, all the different, uh, my opinions on everything. Because I don't know if you figured out, I have a lot of opinions, yeah. Anyway, so, uh, um, so they so they asked me, what's the best chicken soup? I really had to rack my brains. And I realized I've never had any chicken soup that is as good as mine. And all my kids said the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And we just make the best chicken soup in the whole world. Anyway, I have given the recipe out. So go and search for that podcast. I don't have to do that. I have, an, I have a recipe I'm waiting to get. A couple of recipes I want to share with you. But I have so much to talk about. My God. So don't ask him for me. But uh, there are those who say that since it's a question of the woman being able to regain that privacy that she had, even an unmarried woman who loses that sense of privacy needs to cover their hair. Like I say, go talk to your rabbi. I'm not involved. But, you know, I just, it's such a brilliant idea. Right? Okay. You come to the wedding. You have the dancing. Oh, my goodness. The power of politics. Who do you dance with first? You dance with the father, then you dance with the other father. There's the two fathers together, and then you bring your brother, and then you bring the other brother. And, 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 and there's, there's rules and rules and rules. Who goes into the circle first, doesn't that? And it doesn't matter. There's always what nundik. When you finally have that one dance with your Rosh Hashiva, or that one dance with your grandfather, they brought him up with the walker, and they jump in to the circle. <laughs> Yeah, they just missed the cues completely, you know? Um, uh, listen, some people are very high energy. I have a friend of mine, Rabbi Hadar Magolin. He literally wrote the book on Simcha, yeah? He wrote a whole bunch of books on Simcha, yeah? And I remember at his, at his Doors Chasana, he danced the whole time. And at one point, like, there was nobody left. Nobody could keep up with him, and he just was dancing by himself, you know? There's something so incredibly beautiful about that, yeah? And uh, the dancing, I, I 
Yeah, so some some are more high energy, some are more low energy. You're not looking to kill the chasen and the kala, you know. And uh, uh, you know, so some chasen dance a little bit, and then they sit down, and everybody else does the dancing while they watch, you know. And uh, some chasenim are just powerhouses; just keep going. Yeah, and uh, it's uh, as much as you can. You should try to participate. I don't have the energy levels I used to. I'm an old man. When I was younger, I didn't have the energy levels then either. But at least now I have an excuse. You know. So if assuming there's not the old man shuffle circle on the outside. You don't really dance. You just basically adulate. You know, so many people, you just sort of wave back and forth. Sometimes you get this creative group and they switch. Okay. When they don't have the slow circle, I try to stand as close as I can and clap. You know? To be mitzvah. A lot of times you get invited to the wedding just because they need bodies. You know what I'm saying? Not because they want you in particular, you know? So uh, you try to participate as much as you can. Yeah? That's... That's the point. Remember the mitzvahs to be mesamech chas mekala, and that's it. And the more nice things you have to say, as opposed to how come our table didn't get, uh, how come the I see people go over to the chas, oh, we didn't get the main course over here. You know, say please, don't worry about it. You know, uh, the the odds are they're not selling you uh, prime rib. You know. They're serving you like uh, schnitzel from the last wedding, you know, and, and uh, who knows what, you know. Don't, don't worry about it. Stay calm. <laughs> You'll get whatever you're supposed to get in this world. God has not forgotten about you. If you don't get your course, it's quite all right. Have another glass of seltzer. Anyway, they don't have seltzer, drink the water. They don't have to drink the water, then just take the little centerpiece and pour some of it down into your cup. You'll find. Don't worry about it. It's amazing. Yeah, people come for the food. I see people sit at the chasana, and then once they open up, you know, the, the little buffet over there for the bakr, they run over and take a plate from there too. Keep calm. That's not the purpose. Now, at the end, in a secular wedding, the bride and groom run off. They run off together. And they go on their honeymoon. They got on a plane. And they fly to Club Med. And they go to Disneyland, Disney World. And they have a, this week of make-believe. Yeah, wonderful. And then they come home. And they have to start real life. A little bit of a letdown. We don't have a honeymoon. We have a Sheva Brachas. That means the two of you Go home, start your life together, and you are exhausted. And every night, the man has to get ready. He puts on a tie. If he's a real nefunak, he'll brush his, hair, his hat. And he'll put it, and he will sit for three hours while his wife tries to get her shaitel just right. I understand. I don't wear a wig. If I did, I'm sure it would just add another level of stuff that I really don't care about. I'll tell you the truth. You know, I have one of those casual approaches to my hats. You know, um, uh, still have the stain from the chasana where the waiter was serving barekas and then you know spilled some of the mushroom sauce on my hat, and I tried everything to get it out. You know, it's like, it never comes out. So, uh, you know, it's okay, you know, listen, you know, it's not there. When I used to travel years ago, you know, when people would fly. So uh, at my daughter's house in Far Rockaway, she has a little room for me there. And I have a special American hat, a pair of shoes, a belt, got a raincoat, a winter coat, and I've got all kinds of like things. So I go to America, you know, I become like Superman. You know, I have a different phone. I have a rent a car. I've got points. I fly. I go like this. And I'm, 
Then I come back here, turn back into the usual schlump that I am. <laughs> Go back to being Clark Kent. But anyway, so, uh, um, you know, so the wife is very, get her shaito now. By the way, if you want to lose your mom haba, do this. It's funny, but you know you will you will pay for it in the next room. You know, go over to the collar and you go. Is that on backwards? Anyway, it, it doesn't make a difference. Even if she knows you're joking, she's going to go into the bathroom and cry. It's not worth it. Not everything is worth it. Even when it's very funny. When your parents are yelling at you and say, "Is this how they teach you how to act in yeshiva?" and you say, "No, I learned this at home." It's not worth it. Trust me, you'll get a smack and. You know, keep it up, aim is so important. It's a great line, but really, really, you're going to pay for it. And it's just not worth it. You know, I always say, if I go to Olam Abba, it'll be for the times I kept my mouth shut, not for the times that I talked, you know. So instead, every night, you're going to be surrounded by friends and family. Sometimes this becomes very emotional. How come I didn't get a Shavu you know? Okay, join with this other person. But the other person doesn't want to join with you because they've been waiting to make the Shavu Brachas for you since the day you were born. And they have a particular way of doing it and a particular menu. And these other people come in and say, I'll make a potato kugel. And they're like, no, you're not going to make a potato kugel. We're going to make a potato kugel. You know, it's like, and uh, you know, it goes back and forth and back and forth, you know. And you usually find yourself in an overheated room with little plastic chairs on top of each other. And uh, many people who have no business speaking in public will speak, you know? And there's a challenge. There's a challenge to being able to look interested. Not everybody can master this. I cannot. This is one of the reasons I almost never serve on panels because I don't know how to play well with other people. And my dear, dear, beloved friend and Rebbe, uh, Rebbe Yushal Pupko, who always takes pictures, took a picture of me once at a Kenneth. And I think this sums up everything. If you can just get that expression, that, that sense of absolute horror and boredom. <laughs> <laughs> I had this picture and I lost it. I used it once in a poster for a sheer called From Burnout. <laughs> you know, you, you have to sit through it, etc. Is it the most fun? Uh, some Sheva Brachas are a lot of fun. My parents, Olo Shalom, always took the first Sheva Brachas. And uh, when I got married, my kids started getting married. My mother would come in and she would say, I'm doing the first Sheva Brachas. And she had one Shita. A lot of food, only very funny speeches, you know, and everyone just wants to have a good time. And it was great because you'd have this whole the whole wedding and a lot of people don't eat at the wedding, you know, the family because they're running here and they're going here. Said, yeah. And you're kind of exhausted and you come and she would like get some great restaurant and like, everybody just ate and ate. And, you know, and Orlovskis, there are some Orlovskis who are incredibly funny, you know. Um, who would speak. Uh, some of my in-laws would leave in absolute horror uh, because they have never experienced <laughs> anything like this. But that's the way we used to do the first Shevard Brachas. You know, but not every Shevard Brachas is going to be like that. You know, and, uh, you know, but you're going to spend your first week not going on any vacations, surrounded by fr friends and family. When we made Aliyah, it was an absolute disaster. We had uh, four little kids. The oldest was four or five, you know. We're carrying carry-on bags and this, and everything's falling apart. And this couple comes over. Each one scoops up a kid. Each one scoops up a bag, and they get us onto the plane. And afterwards, we thanked them so much. And we said, uh, you know, what, what is this trip? They said, it's our honeymoon. They didn't look like a newly married couple. I said, oh, how long are you married? They said, 10 years. I said, 10 years? He goes, it doesn't pay to have a honeymoon until you're married for 10 years. <laughs> the first week you spend surrounded by family and friends. Because when you're in trouble, when you need to buy a house, when you need somebody to watch the children in an emergency, Mickey Mouse ain't going to be there. 
the people who are making these Sheva Brachas for you are the ones who are going to be there for you. Because when you build your home, which we said in the first podcast, is a Mishkan. You're going to build it with the wood that you got, that your grandfather's grandfather planted for you 400 years ago. And if he was to walk into your house, transport himself from 1620, he would say, microwave. I don't, I don't know what this is. Electric lights? I don't, I've never seen anything like this. You know? Uh, floors with tiles? I never saw such a thing. But I recognize the wood. That's the wood that I planted for you. And it be a Sheb. The way you build a home, you plant the wood that 400 years from now, you want your grandchildren's grandchildren to build their house out of. So that's it for now. If you want to find out more about the podcast, you can go to my website, reverielowski.com. You can leave a comment. You can uh, send me an email. You can... Uh, um, you know, it's, it's so interesting. Somebody uh, said to me, he called me on the phone. He goes, I see you don't answer emails. I said, I do answer emails. It's just you write me an email and you say, when can you this or when can we that? And I just freeze and go, I, I don't know when. Um, um, and I don't answer it immediately. And then it moves down into, into email land. And unless I like move all the way down and start cleaning things out, you know, and have to erase like all those ads that I get, you know, from Dell and, and uh, you know, and Dick's Sporting Goods and stuff, you know what I mean? Until I finally find this email again, you know, I a tremendous amount of proactivity and more emails keep coming in. So <clears throat> I do answer, you know, so uh, like that. You could sponsor an episode. And that's it uh, for this week. Everyone should have a wonderful other. And uh, that's it. I'm Devin Olowski, and this is the Robert Olowski Show. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Torah and Simcha, ready to go. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Knowledge and wisdom will help you grow. Lots of fun in every episode. And we don't have to rhyme. No, we don't. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. On RabbiOrlovsky.com Torah Anytime YouTube and more It's Rabbi Orlovsky Show Torah and Simba Ready to go It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show Till next time Till we meet again It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show Show